Sup, Powerful Nonsenses? How's it going? Welcome to another amazing episode of Powerful Nonsense. We're claiming that it's amazing before we've even begun. We've already recorded it, <laughs> but it's Powerful Nonsense, of course it's amazing. Uh, for those that are joining us for the first time, some introductions. It's good to do that, Wayne, actually. It is it. good to a... do that. I keep forgetting to do it on some episodes. And you have gave us name tags, so yeah, they're probably so popping up somewhere. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I am Wayne Ingram, and this... Jem Yildiz. Is Jem Yildiz. Howdy. And we are the Powerful Nonsense crew. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have to be quite so judgmental. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, yes, so... Uh, Today, we're going to talk about niches. Niching right down. Niching right down. I mean, we went we went to an event. It was a good event. A good yes. event from uh, by Daniel Priestley. Uh, if you don't know him, check him out. Two books, three books book. actually. Oversubscribe, key person of influence, and uh, the last one is Entrepreneur Revolution, which is a lot about the kind of stuff that we talk about here on the podcast. Which are all great books. Honestly, read them, check them out. Uh, and he was holding a, a key person of influence themed event, which we went to, uh, which I think has been quite the inspiration for this episode, quite mm-hmm, a little bit. Definitely. Um, although he wasn't specifically talking about niches, but it certainly informed a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Mm-hmm. Um, so, specifically, we want to look at how you can go about finding out what your niche is. And why niches are so important nowadays. And why niches. Okay, let's, let's start there. Yes. Because I feel like that's a good place to start. So... Why are niches so important? Oh, <laughs> why not? <laughs> um, I think probably mostly just how the world is changing nowadays. Mm-hmm. Obviously, technology means that there's so much more available to us, so much more information, so many kind of... Uh, the population is now open up to everybody. We can now get access to everybody, which also means that we can find people with really unique um, interests, really. Yeah. And I think what's happened is we've kind of moved through the the time scale of where it was all about mass media. We kind of put out an advert on TV and hope it hits everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think what technology and the internet has done is actually allowed people who have very, very micro niche interest to kind of rise to the surface, but at the same time be able to find people who are really interested in in certain topics. And I think you Uh can see that from certain um, Facebook groups. I think in the first talk I went to with um, Daniel Priestley, he actually showed us a, um, a picture online of actually a Facebook group of people who actually collect the stickers off of fruit. And it was an, it was a natural niche. What? Yeah, it actually exists. So there are people out there who have a massive niche, a community where they actually talk and share the stickers they have collected of fruit. And it just literally blew my mind that actually in that community, and it literally had thousands of people. I'm not joking. And, and this is, you probably find this all over the place. Serious? Yeah, and I even listened to like a TED talk recently and this guy was saying that he literally started a podcast and he was a government contractor and he was even saying like, is you can't think of anything more boring, but I still get uh, like, he was getting like 1,500 downloads a day. And he was like, what's happened is that obviously the internet has opened us up so much that actually the micro niche he calls is now mighty. And I think right. that is an exact prime example of how like nowadays you can really, if, if you think, oh, this is only something that I'm interested in, you'll actually find that there are even l- like deeper levels of that niche. And obviously, if that means you can find a community and it's, it's a few thousand people, that means suddenly you could have a business in that area and yeah. serve those people. You don't have to go for everybody anymore. It's all about being really specific. You seem like gobsmacked oh, about the, uh, the, the fruit. The fruit <laughs> thing has just, it's genuinely blown my mind. <laughs> like... I'll actually put it up, I'll find the link to it and I'll put it up on the screen so you guys can see As it. you can probably tell from my gobsmacked reaction, I am not the sort of person that would collect stickers off of fruit. <laughs> um, I just... I, I, that has just completely blown my mind. Like, I didn't even think that was a thing, let alone had a had a niche big enough to get a thousand pe- thousands of people on a Facebook group. Mm-hmm. Like, And I think that just goes to show, like, anything... <laughs> Mm-hmm. You can really take anything and turn it in, into a niche. Like that, I'm honestly, that's like, <laughs> I can't actually think properly because I'm just like, I, this I think, makes no sense. I think what's really interesting as well, like obviously 
initially I don't want to jump the gun too soon, but obviously everybody has niches in certain areas. So yeah. I think one of the ladies that was talking at the KPI event, she was a personal trainer. Mm -hmm. And on a top level, when you hear personal trainer, everybody's heard of a personal trainer. And she was finding that because of being a, a generalist, a general personal trainer, she was finding it really hard to find clients. She was saying that obviously she had to charge what everybody else was char charging. And it was just a massive struggle for her. And then until she kind of realized actually she had experience where she'd um, been burnt out in the past. And we've talked about burnout mm -hmm. before on the podcast. And she was basically saying that actually she'd overcome that thing. And then she thought, actually, what if I niche down? I'm a personal trainer by only focus on people who have been suffering from burnout. Yeah. And she'd obviously wrote a book about that and raised her prices. And now suddenly she only, I think she was saying that she only works with five clients per year or 10 clients mm -hmm. per year. And now she's become a, a niche in her market. Yeah. She only deals with one thing. And I think that, that is ultimately what we want to talk about in this episode, why yeah. it's so important that you have skills, you're an actor, I do video work, but how do we make ourselves into a niche so that actually we're not competing with everybody, that we are specific in what we offer, and that way we bring the most value. And it also means that actually your prices are going to rage, yeah. rage like raise, you become... Rage. They're going to rage. <laughs> your price... I'm expensive! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you're... you're... <laughs> Cheers, Wayne. Sorry. <laughs> he, likes to, he, he likes to pick up on every single time I slip. I'm sorry. Unfortunately. It's, so, it's such a bad quality and I really... I'm beating really, me down. I'm beating sorry. Me down. No, it's all good. I'm trying to cause insecurities for you. Thanks, that's, Wayne. That's my intention. That's very nice of you. I'm sorry. Friends, eh? <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> prices go up because ultimately you become an expert in that particular niche. And what I find is really, if you're into digital marketing like me, what I find is really interesting is if... Probably you may not have used this before. There's a tool called like Keyword Tool Planner, mm -hmm. which is kind of Google's way of actually kind of uh, giving you the subjects that people are searching for. So example, for this lady, she might have used this tool to search, say, um, personal trainer. And then in there, it will pop up all the search terms that come with that topic. And then what she might have seen there is actually loads of people in Google, thousands per month are searching burnout. And then suddenly she realizes that this is a niche worth, worth going after. Another thing with the Google Planner, which I think is amazing, it kind of tells you what the competition level is. So it Does tells it? you like how many people are actually searching that thing, but also how many people are advertising for that keyword. Right. And if it means it's low and it's getting loads of search volume every month, then obviously I would say it's a great way to look at how to find a niche, but at the same time, you don't want to just go after a niche because it's niche. You've got to know yeah. that like this lady, she had... Value. Exactly. She had experience with burnouts. So it's not like she chose something just because it was niche and because the competition was low. She chose it because she knew that she could match her own experience to the niche, right. ultimately. Yeah. Well, I mean, practical advice right there. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think what's what's interesting about niches, um, and I think what people are starting to understand, is that, and I think maybe I even wrote a blog post about this at some point. I don't think it was for Powerful Nonsense. Somewhere. We won't link up to it. But I talk, I talk about this thing uh, called uh, the un not the unique selling point, but the unique sellable cocktail. Schnazzy. Uh, it's something, something I came up with. Buzzwords, eh? Uh, which is essentially kind of what, what micro niches kind of are in a way, which is this thing of, okay, yes, you've got these areas of expertise. Uh, you've got these skills. You can provide value in general terms in that industry. Um. But if you're in that industry, for example, to take from my experiences, I'm an actor. The world is full of actors who all they talk about is being an actor. You get people from that industry in a room and all they'll talk about is what's wrong with that industry and how they're an actor and how we're all, we've all got these same struggles, right? You then go talk to a casting director who you want to employ. And one of the first things you do is introduce yourself as an actor, right? Now, how does that differentiate yourself? It doesn't. Mm -hmm. They are awash with actors. Mm -hmm. And this applies to most industries, I think. What is becomes interesting is if, as an example, I am an actor that, I mean, I'm not, but as an example, you're an actor that has huge interests in uh, motorcycles. Mm -hmm. It's a passion of yours. Mm -hmm. Not so much that you've made a career out of it because you're an actor, not a motorcyclist, but you have a huge passion for motorcycles. A casting breakdown comes through the door for the casting director. They're after somebody to advertise for motorcycles. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to ride a motorcycle. You ride a motorcycle. 
who's the first person that's going to crop into their head when they're looking for somebody mm-hmm. to do to act in that advert? It's going to be you because you're interested in motorcycles. And I think another thing on that point, I think Gary uh, Gary Vaynerchuk mentioned this the other day. He was saying that there was somebody who tweeted into him asking a question of like. I've got my business and then I've got my personal and do you think I should have like two separate accounts? Oh. And I thought what was quite interesting was, and then Gary V's answer was ultimately no, because mm-hmm. the thing is people don't want to know just the one thing you do. Yeah. Actually, it gives you a good perspective of the yeah. whole round personality of that person if you've got, if you're multifaceted. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that people miss out on. And actually yeah. by exposing all those different areas of yourself, you niche yourself down because it becomes actually, like a lot of my video work I do is with charities. And so people might suddenly, because I do do a lot with charities, people might put me into a certain category of people that actually, I don't want to work with a big commercial company mm-hmm. who have only interest in maybe profit and being big. Actually, I want to work with someone who who works with young people who, does the things that right. we do. And so actually I'd rather work with him because he will understand young people better than maybe somebody else. And so right. that puts me into a niche category. So I thought, yeah, that was kind of really fits in there. Yeah, I think it's it's one of those things that I think you need to be aware of. It's not Your niche is not just about your skill. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously it's about what value you can provide, obviously, but it's not just about your skill. It's also about your interests. It's about your experiences. And I think the world is so varied Mm -hmm. Um, like everybody's had different experiences there's no person whose personality is exactly the same as yours Mm -hmm. and I think that applies so much to applying it to your niche and what your interests are Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's another on that topic there I think that's a problem that I think a lot of young people have like have ultimately because you kind of go through that schooling system where you kind of all do the same thing and so when you come out you're all pretty similar and I think that's where a lot of young people miss out in doing certain opportunities like maybe internships or work experience or volunteering because those are the things that suddenly build that kind of fuller picture of who you are yeah whereas a lot of people just come out or maybe you come out of your degree and then suddenly you're no different to the other person with the same degree as you yeah whereas if for that whole time you were there you really got deep into an aspect of whatever it was like you say whether it's acting whether it's getting into motorcycles or maybe you get into future of tech or maybe you start a podcast all these things add another aspect to your being and i think especially while you're young obviously when you're old you've built up all these experiences mm-hmm. you're a dad who works as an accountant you're a this that way and so i think yeah. especially early on especially when you're young yeah. is to find ways to actually build different aspects to yourself so that you become a niche really yeah i just i mean i don't want to open up the education can of worms again <laughs> We've done it many times. We've done it we've many, it many backlog. times. Um, and I think the way I just reacted when you brought up education kind of says a lot. But the point is, is we're teaching people to conform at the moment mm-hmm. in the education system. And I think you can, if you are currently in the education system, particularly if you're at university level, I think you really have an opportunity to find the areas which really interest you. I mean, as an example, I went to university to study acting, right? And within that, there were five to six, diff- no, probably closer to 10 different modules every year about a different aspect of that job. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you want to, you can niche down into that particular module that you do best at, and then you can niche down into a subject within that module because there's going to be different topics within that module Mm -hmm. and you can you've got a structure there to really hone in on what really interests you Mm -hmm. and actually what you're good at because you're being measured against what you're good at as well so i think utilize that because education is trying to do this umbrella thing which is going Mm -hmm. we want to make sure everyone can do as much as possible to build our skills as an economy Mm -hmm. but if you can niche down i think you can really really find an area to provide value and i think as well you've got to think if it's if you're something that's very broad a lot of the time the broad jobs are the things that people are working on quicker to automate they think well this is a broad spectrum mm-hmm. that most people do so it's like if you look nowadays at the skills that are in massive demand it's those very niche things like cyber security right. ux um algorithm design all these kind of things that not it's not they're very very niche down i think that's the that's where the value lies really is understanding that as we move forward, as the the broad, more um, more open jobs that are available to everyone, they're the ones that slowly fall away. And actually, it's the niche. The more niche you get, the actually more protected you are. Actually, yeah, I'd agree. So, we need to thank our sponsor, the University of Northampton. 
these guys have been great to us and great to you because them sponsoring us means we can continue doing this right yep right so uh, the University of Northampton uh, specialise in social enterprise so they're all about degrees obviously because that's what unions do but they're also very very interested in getting their graduates to set up businesses particularly in the social enterprise space which is all about business doing social good so if you're thinking yeah I want a degree but I also want to set up my own business then I highly recommend we highly recommend as alumni that you check them out so head over to northampton.ac.uk all the information is there and we'd like to thank them very much for their support of the show so we have decided a lot has changed as we've been working on this podcast slash youtube channel i mean for one thing youtube right so we now want to talk to you guys to find out how we can deliver more value to you because this is for you it's not for us we know this stuff. It's a little bit for us. It's a little bit for us. We enjoy it. <laughs> but the reason we put this content out is for you guys. So we want to know how we can help you guys better. So we put together a two-question survey. Two questions. It takes literally take you... two minutes. <laughs> Don't even think two minutes. True. Probably, you could probably do it in 30 seconds, right? So we would really appreciate it if you just headed on over there, powerfulnonsense.com forward slash you. We'll put the link in the video if you're watching on YouTube. Um, and we'd just love you to go over there, just answer those two questions. It's really, really quick, just so that we can provide as much value to you as possible. So head on over there and answer them questions. Back to the show. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Hello. Uh, so we're talking about niches mm -hmm. specifically. Uh, <laughs> see what I did there? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we're talking about niches and we've already covered how like why why niches are important specifically the micro niche mm -hmm. and also uh you provided a little bit of a tool as to how to find out whether or not it's something that your market might want or whether or not it's a viable niche in the first place but let's really talk specifics yep and let's try and come up with some actionable things putting pressure on us now some <laughs> actionable things that you can do to try and really hone in on what that niche is I think a good place probably to start is actually understanding what skill sets you already have. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of the time we say, just kind of get a piece of paper, get a pen and start writing down the skills that you already do. Yeah. Maybe that's in your job. Maybe that's something you do freelance. Write down all those skills. And then that's when you kind of want to really pull in the other tools, such as keyword tools. Maybe you want to just go on Google and do some research. Maybe you can jump onto some um, job websites and just mm -hmm. see what are the popular jobs that keep coming up. And then sometimes that way you can kind of see which aspects of what you do uh -huh. are becoming high in demand. And obviously a lot of the time the, the jobs that are high in demand are the things that actually they're struggling to fill the spots. Right. Like at the moment we all know that every single website's banging on about this massive, um, I can't even do this because it's actually real. <laughs> it's like the, um, <laughs> the digital so shortage. There's a massive uh, digital skills gap. So yeah. obviously we know that people are desperate for people that are good at social media. We're desperate for uh, content producers. We're desperate for, as I say, designers, web people, all those programming and massive niches at the moment that there's not enough people out there doing. Yeah. And I think for somebody who's listening to this, I would say is just really find out what skills you have mm -hmm. and assess which ones are in demand because then you'll be able to really move your energy towards one. It doesn't mean you have to stop doing all the other things, but it yeah. just means that you've pinpoint pinpointed where your value lies and then you can go because i think initially it's that whole idea of find what your niche is and then the next step is actually how do we jump into the micro of that niche and mm -hmm. i think at the moment we obviously talked about the uh, seminar we went to um last week or a few weeks back now and i think that's the main key he was saying is that we really need to become key people of influence in the areas that we're passionate about but at the same time where do your skills lie and Obviously, it's really up for people to actually find out that we were saying that if you do find out where your skills lie, you also need to find out, is it a niche for a reason? Is it a niche because there's actually mm -hmm. no demand, nobody's there in that space? Or actually, have you spotted a gap where actually there's huge value because nobody else is doing it? Mm -hmm. I just want to take a little bit of a step back. I know, I quickly said, dropped a load of... You said quite early on. Mm -hmm. You said about uh, finding out what your skills are. Yes. Okay. And listing those skills. Mm -hmm. Now, just to be clear, mm -hmm. I know what the answer is, but just in case yes. people have missed it, 
when you're I was speaking pretty quick. No, no, so no, no, I no, could no, imagine. no, no, not not because you didn't, <laughs> not because you said it too quick, but more because you didn't specify. Okay, but that's not a dig at you. That's more just to clarify for them. Okay, <laughs> uh, you'll you'll see where I'm going. So when you're writing your list of skills, mm-hmm. do you focus only on the skills in that industry, or do you focus on your collective skills across all work? I think ultimately you want to pull in every skill that you know you have available. I think it doesn't. I, knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it doesn't matter. It's not about kind of saying, okay, this is my job. This is what I get paid for. Because there are skills that maybe at the moment that skill is a hobby, but mm-hmm. it's hugely in demand or it's coming into demand. And I think that's what it's about. It's not, yeah, it's not just keeping it really segregated into what you currently do. And I think that's basically where you'll find value that way because uh-huh. the hobby skills usually they're the things that maybe you're a bit more innovative in you're not because a lot of the time we know that a lot of companies are quite backwards maybe they're not already innovating some people are all just like just about embracing social media but if you've been running your blog and you've been knowing how to promote on youtube and whatever else mm-hmm. that could be a really powerful skill set that you know is in demand and maybe that's the thing that might transition you into um into say doing your own doing your own thing but mm-hmm. another point i wanted to really bring up was the idea that I think a lot of the time, as people I speak to a lot of the time, they say, well, I do this, I have these skills in my job, but I wish I had skills like you, digital skills, production skills. And I think what people underestimate is just how easy it is. If you know that your a skill is in demand, how to upskill yourself as well and start. If it, I, don't, I don't think people should ever upskill in something just for the sake of it. Mm-hmm. You've got to have a general interest and actually do it. Otherwise, you probably won't finish the course. Online courses have a ridiculous dropout rate, which I found out. I think Seth Godin was saying like 98% of people don't finish an online course. Even if they've paid for it. Even if they're paid for it. Because obviously you pay quite low for it. So actually people find it Uh easier to drop out. Right. Which is why a lot of people end up staying at university because they paid so much and then get the degree even though they probably don't want it by that point, point, which sometimes happens. But ultimately it's the idea that you can't, just because it's a niche and it's it's popular at the moment, like everyone's saying, oh, should I learn coding? It's like, yeah, it's a niche thing. But if it's going to be a pain in the ass to learn, and you actually aren't going to enjoy it, and you're just doing it for the sake of the outcome. It's just uh-huh. like, okay, I'm going to get a big pay at the end of it. It's just not the right way to go about it. Yeah, I think if you, I think the the more logical thing to do in that in that sense is uh, what, and it kind of goes back to is it niche for a reason? Like, okay, yeah, it's great to do coding if you're going into computer science related stuff. Mm-hmm. But as an example, if you're not doing computer science related stuff. You have no need for coding whatsoever, mm-hmm. really. Um, coding is the niche within the the micro niche within the digital design yeah. uh, industry, really, because the coding is the coding is comes to the point where it's like I need something that's not already been designed. I mm-hmm. need to create something new from scratch. That's the only reason you're going to need coding. Uh, so, as an example, uh, if you're, it's better to look at what your in what your industry needs. Mm-hmm. If you're going to upskill, uh, what your industry needs and what your niche needs to upskill first, rather than going. Uh, but then that being said, it's a catch twenty two because I have like I've have a uh, uh, what do you passion? Have? Not a passion, but I enjoy website design. Yes, right. Specifically, I actually enjoy design, um, and I enjoy technology, and so website design has married the two. Mm-hmm. Right, but I'm not a website designer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm an actor. But uh, if an actor, for example, wants a website, I could be an ideal person to go to. Yes, because I enjoy building websites. I am an actor, so I understand what the industry needs. And so I've upskilled the website design. Mm-hmm. And so I could build a business building actors websites yeah oh me that's a perfect example of how you find a niche uh, uh, yeah a niche within no the micro niche within the niche so mm-hmm. a lot of people do web design you go one layer deeper you do actors maybe you only if you can go even deeper than that and maybe you say that i only do um maybe you only do it for people who are starting out in acting right. or maybe i do it with only successful actors so i only work with the best actors to do their websites right and i think that's really important but another thing that i kind of really want to kind of touch on because at the moment we're talking a lot about these niche skills and right. how to get certain upskilling ourselves. Mm-hmm. But actually, like I was saying earlier, is that a niche could actually be, and it doesn't have to be a skill set in particular. It could be based on an area. So like right. if you, if you're a personal trainer and then you move to a village where you're the only personal trainer, 
<laughs> you're suddenly a niche because there's no mm-hmm. one else that offers that thing in that area. Or maybe if you're um, like an animator, maybe you animate in a way that's so unique that actually you become a niche in your style and you get yeah. that with artists. Artists oh, are known all the time. They're known for their style. And I know all a few people that I follow on Instagram and stuff and their art is so unique that nobody could copy it. And that's a way of becoming a niche. Well, look at Picasso. Yeah. As a famous artist who's got a very defined style. You know when you're looking at a Picasso painting or at least a Picasso-inspired painting. Mm-hmm. Even to the point that in Toy Story, Miss Potato Head's got all his oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff in the wrong place. <laughs> and like, Look, I'm Picasso. Uh, and, and, and that's a prime example mm-hmm. where style has defined mm-hmm. uh, what your niche is. Mm-hmm. And also even customer service. We know a lot of these like digital companies now, they have a software product like Buffer, but they're known for their customer service. Mm. And it's finding actually there's there's so many ways to be a niche within your industry and it's kind yeah. of spotting which one you want to go after because you might go after customer service. The other person makes it the most pretty looking software. Somebody else makes it the cheapest software. Somebody else makes it a high-end software. And it's kind of... There's so many options available to you. And I think that's probably where a lot of people might struggle is kind of finding which one to go for. And I think Mm -hmm. maybe it means just testing things out. Maybe it means you try, I don't know, maybe you try high end. Maybe you try being the most friendly. Maybe you only take on a few clients like the lady she did burnout. It's kind of maybe she just test that out and see how it goes really. Yeah. I think another thing to consider as well when you're looking at, uh, at niche is, okay, you've settled on your industry. You've settled on whatever skill set or whatever. Um, then I think one of the big questions to ask is how can you provide something that the rest of the industry can't provide? Mm -hmm. Um, Or even how can you do things in a better way than the industry's done it already? As an example, Netflix is a prime example Mm -hmm. that really their big competitor when they started was Blockbuster. Mm -hmm. And they were like, okay, well, how can we make this easier and better than Blockbuster. Well, we'll build a website. You can uh, initially, I think you just you ordered it online, and they sent they sent the video to your house. I think was originally how it started, or well, the DVD got mm-hmm. the video. I'm showing my age. Uh, <laughs> uh, the DVD to your house, and oh. then you had to send it back to them within a few mm. a certain deadline. Otherwise, you get fined, right? And then it then became okay. Well, there's got to be a better way to be able to do that. Well, how about You just pay us a subscription fee and then you can just stream the video you're renting to be able to watch as many videos as you like. Mm -hmm. And now, because of that, they're now competing with TV channels. Mm -hmm. They've become a separate TV channel because they've innovated so much that they've moved so far away from their original niche that they've actually moved into something else entirely. And I think it's that those questions of how can I do it different? What can I bring that the rest of the industry can't bring? Mm-hmm. And how can I make it better than the rest of the industry is currently doing it? Yeah, I think a prime book, I mean, it's been out for ages. Obviously, we speak about it a lot, is Purple Cow by Seth Godin. Right. Ultimately, you've got to find out what differentiates you to everybody else. There's so much competition. We know there's global competition nowadays. It's like, why does somebody choose you? And I think if you want to be competitive in the future, you need to be known for something and you need to be... Like the whole talk was about key personal influence. Right. He was saying how important this is going to be in the future. So, and and, and I, I want to talk about a little, another thing, obviously we've obviously struggled ourselves initially yeah. to find our niche. We still haven't. We're still looking for it. We're still looking for a niche <laughs> somewhere. Even with the podcast, like we, we enjoy talking about this stuff, but we don't know exactly what our niche is. I do a lot of video production work and I haven't niched myself down enough. So it's really important to kind of share this information out because actually yeah. as I'm saying it, I'm listening to myself and saying actually, you probably could niche down a couple of, a couple of levels, really. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, you could, yeah. I mean, we've already mentioned it in the mid roll, but if you could uh, hop on over and do that survey, powerfulnonsense.com forward slash you, uh, I mean, that would really help us to niche, help us to niche down. So, we would really appreciate if you just took a minute of your time just to do that. Um, but yeah, and it is, it's that thing of just niching down and going, okay, can I? Can I add another element to this? Or or more, can I take away elements of this? Uh-huh. Uh, it kind of depends on how you want to look at it. But can I add more specificity to what I'm doing? Uh-huh. Let's try saying that when you're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just go one step down, one step down, one step down, one step down. And sometimes you're not going to be able to do it straight away. Because mm-hmm. sometimes you are going to have to focus in and then go 
okay, yeah, we focused him. And then go, right, I need to focus in even more. I mean, really, if you look at Powerful Nonsense, when it first started, before it was a podcast... It was just my general musings right? <laughs> on life. biohacking, it was mindset, it was, yeah, just general musings. And then we turned it into a podcast, and then it niched down into a podcast. Um, and then from there, it niched down into less about the biohacking stuff, more about the business stuff and the mindset stuff. And so we, are, we over years, are slowly starting to niche down. That's a really great point as well, because then if you are somebody that's quite broad initially, I think a lot of the niching actually comes from feedback. Yeah. And I think feedback or your customers will start to define where your strengths are. Yeah. And then slowly by slowly, you will kind of niche down. I think that's probably a good way to, place to start, because it might be quite extreme to think oh, i'm just going to go for only if you're a personal trainer for example and you say well i'm only going to train people who i don't know something that's super niche have a certain disease and then suddenly you think well i've got no clients now because <laughs> <laughs> i need to figure out how yeah. to get them interested so actually starting somewhere and engaging feedback and maybe it's something there's a process over time but i think the quicker you can get to find where you stand out and then you start being yes. known in that area because i know a few people that i've done work with especially video clients they're so niche in what they offer that they are known as the person to go to in that industry. Yes. And I think that's probably a good point is that it might happen over time. It might mean having that communication with people you do work for. And yeah, it's just really being aware of where things are going and if there's demand in that thing that you're going into. Yeah. Just a quick question. Yes. Just before we wrap up, because yeah. I know we're getting close to time. Uh, do you think, because I think we need to clarify this given what we've just said. Uh-oh. Would you recommend more putting out a general net and niching down or doing your research first, getting a specific niche and going straight for that? I think initially, I think because we've nowadays we've got tools, mm -hmm. I think if we didn't have the tools, I think you kind of have to just go out there with a the net and just see where you end up going. But I think nowadays there's tools available, like I said, using Google, finding finding areas that are already available out there. I think you can start with a like a guess on what a niche is within an industry mm -hmm. and you can test the waters a lot faster nowadays yeah, so i think fair. initially don't go out too broad maybe one step down kind of get slightly niched in what you do and then from there it will probably go a little bit further so i don't think you have to start too broad okay is that I just right wanted, yeah i just wanted to clarify that because we kind of gave slightly contradicting advice so i just wanted to do you, do you agree with that yes i do agree with that well that's perfect then i think both are fine but i think you may as well utilize the tools that you've got Mm -hmm. uh, to get the results faster from niching down quicker. Yeah, so, yeah and totally just, agree with that. just be open to that feedback because a lot of the time people will tell you where they think you should head and maybe if a lot of demand's coming from that, then that's probably the aspect or the area that you can go into. Cool. Cool. So I think actually, if I may say so, I think we've actually managed to do that amazing episode that I mentioned at the beginning. I don't know. Can we be the judges of that? I'm going to be, <laughs> you know, I'm going to put it out there, <laughs> right? I'm going to be the, the non-humble guy. The humble I mean, brag. And the humble brag. I think that was a good episode, guys. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, thank you guys very much for tuning in. We wouldn't be able to do this without you guys. Mm -hmm. So we're very grateful for your attention. Um, could you do us a massive favor? First Please. of all, could you do that survey that I mentioned, powerfulnonsense.com forward slash you. Uh, also, if you could please hit some subscribe buttons on YouTube. It's in your corner. It's definitely in your corner. I've been editing a few episodes now. <laughs> <laughs> on YouTube or on iTunes if you're listening to the podcast. And please leave comments or reviews because it helps get the show out there and also we want to know what you guys are enjoying and we want to be able to serve you as best we can and that really helps with that so thank you guys very much for tuning in and we'll catch you next time see you later 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 i don't know why i went a bit irish oh, at the end. later <laughs> <laughs> <Tatty> boy. <laughs>